Good morning. Um, man, I know when y'all woke up this morning, that cold air smacked you right in the face, didn't it? Yeah, it's fall, right? Nothing like a North Carolina 30 degree drop in temperatures from one day to the next, right? Get you up and motivated and ready to come to church. Um, it's been a busy week. It's been, uh, wow, just an interesting week. Um, now is our time to um, kind of forget about all of that and focus on uh, our time of worship with the Lord. So we'll use this prayer time and our praise and worship song to do just that. Uh, so let's all go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for bringing us here one more time this side of glory, Lord, to to thank you and praise you for all of the awesome things that you've done for us throughout the week. Lord, th throughout this week we've had uh, trials, we've had um, praises, we've gone through all kinds of things, and, and Lord, you've been right there with us, guiding us and strengthening us, and we can't thank you enough for it. And so, Lord, I pray that you help us to focus on uh, our hearts on worship and what we can bring to this worship service this morning. Lord, I pray that through the singing and through the preaching, that something uh, is, uh, is said or sung that we can hold close to our hearts and use in our daily lives and draw closer to you. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we are glorifying the name of the Lord this morning. I will praise you with all my heart. Psalms chapter 86, verse 12. Let's all stand together and sing, glorify thy name. be seated. Village, they were hard-hearted towards receiving the gospel. 
The turning point was when we distributed gift boxes. I saw a great impact. After the distribution, many of children gave their life to Jesus and started with the greatest vision. The gift is shared in the soil in this form because it's the word of God. I've seen Jesus putting hope upon the sun. God is doing a great work.
If you need more information on what to pack or how to pack the box, you can go to the Samaritan's Purse website. We have printed copies in the uh, lobby on the credenza out there. If you need any other information, feel free to contact uh, Marsha Frazier or myself. And uh, our goal this year is for 100 shoe boxes. And the last day for uh, dropping them off here will be November 15th. Also, if you want to contribute, but you don't want to pack a shoebox and just want to bring the items, uh, we have a group that's going to be working to take those items and pack boxes. Or if you want to just donate, uh, I'm sure we can find some people that will be happy to go shopping and get those. So, uh, and as the uh, most important for last, don't forget <coughs> to pray about what you, know, you should do for this. It's a great... Uh, uh, gospel opportunity. Thank you, Steve. Um, as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer, um, if you look in your bulletin, uh, Thelma lovingly puts a prayer request list in, in the bulletins uh, every week so you can see those folks uh, from our congregation, loved ones who uh, are in need of special prayer this week. Also, uh, Richard. Uh, sends out uh, emails throughout the week when needs uh, arise. Uh, so you can be looking at, uh, at and praying for those. I'm sure there are other folks that are on your hearts this morning. So let's uh, all go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you again for, for um, giving us the opportunity to gather together. I thank you for each and every person that is here this morning in this place. Lord, to uh, get our spirits filled. Um, Lord, uh, you know the names that are on our prayer request list, folks that are in special need right now. Lord, I pray that you lift those folks up. Some of them uh, are in need of physical healing. We pray, Lord, that you would lay your healing hand on them, Father God, and, and bless them tremendously. Lord, help them to recover from whatever it is uh, that they're facing. Uh, and Lord, there are some who uh, are in spiritual crisis. Um, we know that Satan fights us in so many ways, um, and, and it's uh, not flesh and blood that we always are fighting against, but it's uh, spirits, the spirits of this world. Uh, and so, Lord, I pray that you um, would give us all the strength and the courage that we need to face uh, those trials and those temptations. Lord, help us to understand that you always have our back, that you are fighting on our behalf behind the scenes. Lord, you are our strength and our comfort, and we thank you so much for that, Lord God, especially during these difficult times when we need you the most. And Lord, help us, Lord, to, to be in prayer even when things are going great. Uh, Lord, uh, um, we don't want to be the Christian who only comes to you when we are in need, but comes to you each and every day and lets you know how much we love you and thank you for all that you do. Lord, we pray for our first responders, uh, our law enforcement officers, Lord, that you be with our men and women who uh, are putting their lives on the line each and every day for us to keep us safe. Um, Lord, I pray for our uh, uh, folks that are fighting on our behalf overseas, Lord, uh, our men and women in uniform in the armed services who uh, can't be with their families, uh, Lord, our uh, just in various places around the world, um, fighting for freedom. Uh, Lord, uh, I pray that you uh, help them to know and understand that there are people that love them uh, and, and uh, are praying for their safety. Lord, I pray for our church. We pray for Park Place. Lord, you know uh, our needs here at Park Place, uh, both uh, uh, individually as, as uh, members of this congregation and also as a church body. Lord, I pray that you would help us to come together, Lord, in a mighty special way and uh, help lead us in the direction you would have us to go. Lord, I pray that your spirit continues to fill this place, Lord, that you send us opportunities to minister to others, Lord. Help us, like the shoebox ministry, 
uh, send us uh, other opportunities to be able to help others, Lord, because that's what we desperately want to do. We want to be here to, to help those that are in need uh, in our community, in our church, to show them the love of Jesus Christ each and every day. Uh, now, Lord, as we continue with our service, I pray that you be with uh, Pastor Blair as he brings us the message that you have laid upon his heart, Lord. Prayerfully, uh, we will be able to hold that message close to our hearts and use it each and every day. Lord, I thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, before we, we sing our congregational hymn this morning, there's kind of a, a funny story behind it. Um, you, you all know that I, I pick on Kimmy from time to time about the way she talks and, and, and uh, make, uh, because she has that uh, countryfied accent and, I, and I'll pick on her about being from Randolph County. Well, earlier in the week, yeah, I know, I got to be careful. We got a lot of folks from Randolph County in here. But um, earlier in the week, uh, I can't even remember exactly what we were talking about, but usually I am the example of pronunciation and grammar in my home and I was trying to say the word washed and it came out worst, right? Really like country is cornbread and, and I said it and as soon as I said it I stopped dead in my tracks and she stopped and looked at me for a second and then we just both died laughing uh, for several minutes. Um, I meant to say washed. Okay, but afterwards I was like, well, I know what we're going to sing for our congregational hymn this Sunday. So if you all would, um, uh, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Psalms chapter 51 verse 7. Let's all stand together and sing, are you washed in the blood? Have you been? Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright? And be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. You may be seated. We are blessed to have Pastor Mark Blair with us this morning. We thank you for being with us, sir. Um, did your 
dad have a TV repair shop in town years ago? That was your uncle. Okay. Okay. So well, I, I heard uh, uh, about that and was wondering. Um, Thank you for being with us this morning. I can't wait to hear what the Lord has laid upon your heart. When I'm finished singing this song, the floor is yours, sir. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You're my friend and You are my brother even though You are a King. I love You more than any other, so much more than anything. strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart desire and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship Thank you, Chris. That's uh, one of my favorites. I love that, based on the scriptures. It's good to be back with you again. Uh, it was two months ago I filled in, and I'm glad to help out again today. Richard Thayer called me this week and asked if I would be available to come and preach. I believe he said the next two weeks. So uh, evidently, unless something changes, I'm down for next Sunday, too, if anybody wants to come back. <laughs> next week, we just never know from one week to the next, but uh, that's what I was told, and that's what I wrote down. So I'm looking forward to being here not just this Sunday, but next Sunday, too. And I'll sure be praying with you all about your pursuing an interim pastor. I know Andy real well. We go back decades. He's a Thomasville boy, too. So uh, God bless you as you consider all of that as you look to the future and what God has in store for you uh, in the days and weeks and months ahead. 
God bless you. And thank you for promoting Operation Christmas Child. That brings back so many memories of churches I've been in over the years. And I just love that ministry. I know it goes back to the 1990s. And uh, we jumped in on that almost from the get-go uh, in churches I've been at. And I've just thoroughly enjoyed that. It's a wonderful ministry. All right. Today, I want to preach from one of my favorite books of the Bible, a book that I have done numerous verse-by-verse -verse studies on over the years, the book of Daniel, Daniel in the Old Testament. I'm going to preach today on the first chapter of Daniel. You may consider this somewhat of a, of a biographical type sermon uh, where you preach on figures of scripture, although it's not really going into the whole life of Daniel, but I do want to use him as the support for what I'm preaching on today. Uh, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I do want to start in chapter 1 at verse 8 and read through the rest of the chapter. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs has set over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be examined before you and the countenances of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants." So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king intervie interviewed them, and among them all none was found, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. May God bless this reading from his holy word. I entitled this message, One of the Greatest one of the greatest, because I believe that Daniel is clearly one of the greatest saints in all of Scripture. For one thing, even though he was human like all of us are, there is never one thing ever said about his life that was sinful. Nothing is ever written or said about Daniel that shows that he was somehow in disfavor with God. Uh, the only other person I can think of like that would possibly be Joseph of leading figures in the Old Testament uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, Daniel is a unique person, to say the least, a great man of God. But what he is going through here in chapter 1 speaks volumes to what we as Christians are going through today. Because, you see, the book of Daniel speaks to the issues that we as Christians are facing today. Daniel, like many believers in our generation, was raised in a godly home with a strong value system. I was raised that way. I was fortunate to be born in a Christian home. 
I went to church every Sunday. My parents were leaders in the church. I had no say in the matter. <laughs> there were many Sundays I didn't want to go to church. I wanted to stay home or do something else. I had to go to church. And now I look back and I'm so thankful that I had those godly parents who made me go to church with them every Sunday. Daniel was brought up in a godly home from all we can gather. He was a devout Jew, a lover of God and the law and the word of God. And here now, as we read the book of Daniel, we see that this young man, very wonderful young man, has been thrust into a society that's marked by pluralism and paganism. Pluralism means this is a, he's, he's now part of the great Babylonian empire, which has incorporated religions from all over the world of that time and brought them together so they all might be obedient to the great king, Nebuchadnezzar. And this was filled with all kinds of idolatry, worshiping all types of false gods. And here's Daniel, a believer in the one true God, and he is thrust into a society that accepts all kinds of religions, all types of gods, all types of beliefs, because they believe this is what's best. Well, you look at the world today, even in our own beloved America, we're in the same thing. We as Christians have never been as attacked as we are being now. Even though there were times in the past we thought of ourselves as a Christian nation, that is far from the case today. In fact, Christianity is now looked down upon. Uh, now we are promoting all kinds of religions. Uh, this is the way to go today. It comes under a lot of different names. But here's Daniel. What's he going to do? His nation has been conquered. He himself has been captured along with many others. They've been made slaves. He has been forced to go all the way to Babylon. And now he's being trained and re-educated so that he might fit into a new society. Very different from what he was accustomed to. How is he going to handle this? What is he going to do? That is where what Daniel does speaks to us today. Churches today have four choice choices on how to address the culture in which we now live because we live in a very, very different country than the country I remembered growing up in and the country that was here when I first began my ministry back in the 1970s. It's very different today. So we have to decide how are we going to deal with this? What are we going to do? We have four choices and they all begin with the letter C to help you to remember it a little bit better. All churches are having to face this dilemma, this crisis. What are we going to do? Number one, the first choice we have is compromise. Compromise. Now, a lot of churches are doing that today. They're saying that we've got to learn to get along. So society's changing. Society's values, beliefs are changing. We have to sort of try to meet them hit, uh, halfway. We need to compromise. We need to stop stressing some of those beliefs that we have preached on and taught over the years because this offends people. This hurts their feelings. So people don't want to hear that anymore. And I can give you evidences of my own ministry over the years. I've had people come up to me after I've preached and said, preacher, you need to realize you can't preach that anymore. At one time you could, but they say now, oh, you shouldn't preach that. It upsets people. Compromise. A lot of people are compromising just to get along. So whether or not the Bible speaks clear on this or not has become almost irrelevant. I told the last church I pastored years ago, and it probably shocked them back then. This was before, this was 10, 15 years ago, a lot different back then than it is now, that 
if things don't change, we're going to get to the point where people are just going to pretty much forget about the Bible. Uh, we're going to have new ch type of churches where the Bible is sort of put on the back shelf, not even preached anymore, or just a few verses here and there that we can get along with will be preached. Compromise. Number two is condone. And tragically, some are going this route today. They're actually changing their, their value system. They're changing their beliefs. They're not preaching and teaching and believing what they used to because they want the world, the culture, to like them. And so we're not going to preach that. We're not going to teach that. We're not going to believe those things anymore. So that's the second choice. Just go along with the crowd. Just approve of what they're saying. That I've had people come up and say, well, preacher, you know, times have changed and we have to change with them. Well, I can agree with that with some, you know, minor issues. But when it comes to the basic teachings of the Bible, God help us if we're going to start changing that too. To where we're now saying the Bible doesn't say what we thought it meant all those years. Now it means something totally different. You'd be surprised how many people are doing that today. That's the second choice. We can condone. Third, we can condemn. And there are a lot of churches that are doing this. They're ratting and raving and they're condemning and they're criticizing all these terrible things that are going on in our culture, but they're not willing to do anything about it. They're just taking a very comfortable seat in their churches or wherever they are, and they're they're, they're running the country down and saying all these negative things, but they're not willing to roll up their sleeves and get out there and try to do something about it. They're just content to sit back, do nothing, and just condemn, just criticize. And the world just continues to go down the same path it's going down, and they're not doing one thing to try to change anything. That's condemn. And then the fourth C, and that's the one I support that we as churches can do today. And that's the word confront. Confront. That is, we see what's going on and we want to change things. We want to do something about it. Now, Daniel definitely speaks to this. He had a situation where he could, he could go into any one of these four avenues. He chose confront in what he said. There have been many people in my life, famous preachers, authors, who have had a great influence on me when it comes to these cultural issues. Some are dead now, uh, like Francis Schaeffer. Uh, uh, he was such a great impact on my life in the 70s and 80s, a great apologist, defender of the faith, but he definitely taught, get out there and make a difference. How Should We Then Live was the great book he wrote and some others. Uh, James Kennedy, uh, not Baptist, Presbyterian, but I loved him. I used to hear him all the time down in Florida. He was always preaching on so many of the great cultural issues of the day. And then I think of those who are still living that have had a great influence on me, Erwin Lutzer, who recently retired at Moody Church up in Chicago, still all, all over the radio. Love hearing him all, all during the week on radio. He graduated from Dallas Seminary like I did years ago, and he's just, oh, I've got, you go to my, to my home and go to my library, you'll see so many books by Erwin Lutzer, a great man of God. Uh, he always preaching, teaching on the culture and how we as Christians are to impact it. Uh, 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 David Jeremiah, uh, another graduate of Dallas Seminary, he's a very popular TV preacher, also on the radio. Uh, my mother, uh, she's been dead for years, that was her favorite radio preacher. Uh, and, I, and anyway, she was so, so proud that I went to the same school that David Jeremiah went to. Uh, but anyway, he's got, you go to my library, you'll see all these books of David Jeremiah. He's still very active, even though he's getting close to 80 years old now, but he's still very active and uh, preaching and, and he deals with, in fact, he wrote a book years ago and called, that deals with these very issues. He says, uh, the, the name of the book is, uh, I never thought I'd see the day. Have any of you ever said that? I never thought I'd see the day where all these things are happening. 
And I'm, I'm in there. I, I never thought I would see the day that we're seeing today. All these things that have changed. And of course, Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham. Oh, love that man so much. Talk about somebody who stands up for what's right. He is so vilified. He is so hated and despised in the news media. But he's still going strong. He's still standing up, preaching the gospel, leading ministries. But, oh, that's the risk you take. That's the risk Daniel took. So here I want to quickly go through three great lessons for us to learn from Daniel chapter 1. First, don't give in. Don't give in. Be resistant. This is what Daniel done. Most everybody else in Daniel's shoes would have given in. I mean, hey, we've been conquered. We've been defeated. We've got to go along with the program. We've got to eat what they tell us to eat, drink what they tell us to drink. What we used to believe, how we used to live, doesn't matter anymore. We're in a new world, a new country. We're under new gods, so let's just change and go along with whatever seems to be appropriate. He says no. He was brought up in the Word of God. The Word of God's very specific in the Old Testament about dietary principles, what you can and cannot eat, how to prepare foods. He, he wasn't going to eat this food. This was food that had been sacrificed to idols. This will be an issue even in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul has to address this in the church at uh, Corinth, I believe. But he's not going to eat. He's not going to defile himself. He's just going to, he, he, he tells the person who's over him, look, I know you're concerned about our welfare. Well, you've got to present us before the king after three years. Hey, I want, to, I, I want you to just give me a chance. Let's eat vegetables and just drink water for 10 days. A ten, test, test, 10 days and see if it makes any difference. Daniel's doing all this because he wants to continue to obey God and not give in to the culture. Don't give in. Be resistant. Notice here in verse 8, as I read this passage, Daniel purposed in his heart. That is, Daniel prayed about this, considered it. He made up his mind. In spite of all the risk, all the dangers involved, he was going to resist the order Stand up. Are you willing to stand up today to what you know in your heart of hearts what is true? In spite of the cost? Jesus demands that of us. He doesn't just suggest it. He demands that we stand up for him no matter the cost. I can say with great pride, I'm so proud of our Southern Baptist Convention over, the, over these years, standing for the truth and the integrity of the Word of God. The news media has vilified us as well. They've tried to intimidate us. We have so many issues that come up that completely contradict what so many in the culture are upholding today, but we hold to the sanctity of life. We hold to the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman. We hold to the inspiration of scripture. We hold to the deity and lordship of Jesus Christ. All four of those beliefs are under a severe attack today in our country. In our country, they're all being attacked. In our Southern Baptist Convention, along with other, I'm not, we're not the only ones, but there's other groups, of course, also that are holding the line. But I thank God that our convention is holding true, and they're under enormous pressure, both from within and without, to change, to try to get the world off our backs to where they'll like us more. The only way the world's going to like us if we stop believing the Bible. No other way. But we're not supposed to seek the world's approval. The Bible says, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
Jesus told us, as the world has hated me, so it will also hate you. He said that to the disciples. And they took it to heart and they went out and turned the world upside down. And all of them, with the possible exception of one, were violently killed by the world. But Jesus said, as the world has hated me, who was also violently killed by crucifixion on a cross, he said, they will hate you. It's no different. Today, we're still hated. It's just that we're not accustomed to that. We lived so long in America thinking we were loved. And now that that is changing, a lot of us are struggling. We don't know how to handle it. And that's why this message is so important. We're going to have to wake up and realize what we're facing today. Don't give in. Be resistant. Like Daniel we must draw the line on certain issues today. We have to make tough decisions, not compromising the truth. We have to, you know, the old hymn, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Oh, I wonder how many churches still sing that today. But that is so appropriate for what we're facing today. Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount has that section we call the Beatitudes. Listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Notice what he said there. You will be persecuted. They'll say terrible things about you for my sake. For Jesus' sake. People today don't like the word, the name Jesus. I remember years ago in this county, I had been asked to say the prayer before a high school football game. That used to be a very common practice. I grew up with that. I went to Thomasville here. We always had a local preacher pray before the football game. This was about 20 years ago. I had done this several times before. But I remember the last time that I prayed. I prayed, I closed my prayer in the name of Jesus. The very next year, and I'm not saying that my prayer had anything to do with it, but the very next year, they stopped prayers because somebody complained. Don't use the name Jesus in public schools. It offends people. Whoever thought we'd see the day, but we have. It's all around us. We're not to isolate ourselves from the culture, but we are to insulate ourselves from it. We can't just hide. That's an easy temptation to give into. But we do have to insulate ourselves to where they're not going to influence us in what we believe and how we behave. What does Paul say in Romans 12 to? Be not conformed to this world but be transformed. We think heavenly. We think godly. We don't think worldly. We're not to be conformed. We're not to move into the world's grasp to where they like us and they approve of us because we're one of them. God, help us. Then we really lose our testimony. Okay, number two. I said number one, don't give in. Be resistant. Number two, don't give up. Don't give up. Be consistent. I see this in verses 9 through 16. Notice in verse 9, God had brought Daniel 
into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the units. You see, any time we have issues around us, confrontations, we have to realize God knows about this more than we do. We have to trust in him. We depend too much on ourselves and our abilities to handle our own problems as if God's just sort of out there, who knows where, just looking in on us. No, God is in control, and he's in control of all this, and God is well pleased with Daniel that he's taken a stand, and he is in the favor of God. We're not to give up. We are to be consistent. You notice here in verse 12, he says, Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Daniel is going to not give up, but be consistent. He comes up with a solution to this problem that will honor his God. Some Christians... give in to the temptation to be like the world. They're overwhelmed by our culture. They just throw up their hands and give up. Some Christians compromise their standards so they won't lose their position or even their promotion. Remember when I was here two months ago, I remember preaching on that passage in John 12, 43, that not that verse is really not all that familiar with a lot of people, but to me it's so striking in how, how it's so relevant where it says they love the approval of men more than the approval of God. And I'm, I'm afraid that sometimes if we're not careful, we're changing our positions, even our lifestyles, because we don't want to fall out of favor with people or we don't want to lose a position with our employment, our promotions, and things like that. And we just sort of bury our stand and our beliefs on so many things. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, that whosoever confesses me before men, I also will confess before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father. Well, what's more important to you folks? The approval of men or the approval of God? Sometimes it comes down to that, that situation. Maybe not. But at least when we have that opportunity to stand up for Jesus, we better do it. Because we have to answer to God if we don't. But... As I've preached many times over the years, the great phrase in Scripture, if there's one phrase in the Word of God that typifies the times in which we now live, it is this. It's in the Old Testament and it's in the New Testament. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul quotes that in Romans. We've always had that, but we just see it so much more today. And this is what's governing so much of our society. People know, don't fear God anymore. People used to. But that's why we see so much crime today, so much open sin. People just live in ways that we never thought would be approved. And now it's not just approved, it's, it's heralded, it's congratulated. And people who live godly Christian lives today are condemned as being judgmental, narrow-minded, bigoted, because now it's supposed to be everything goes. We're not to criticize anything. Whatever a person wants to do, that's fine. Go along with the, with the crowd. Daniel teaches us not to play politics, but be determined to please God. All right, lastly, number three, verses 17 through 21. I've said don't give in, be resistant, don't give up, be consistent. Number three, don't give out, 
Be persistent. Don't give out. Be persistent. Daniel is going to follow through. He's determined to see this through. He knows God is on his side and God will look after him. And we see this in verse 17, that God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. Daniel had understanding that they had never seen before. Even the great Nebuchadnezzar is going to be overwhelmed as these chapters unfold in the book of Daniel over the enormous wisdom of this young man. And Daniel is going to continue, as verse 21 says, till the first year of King Cyrus. When this chapter begins, we're in the year 605 B.C., the first of three attacks on Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian forces. Daniel's a teenager. Now, at the end of the chapter, we go to King Cyrus, who's head of the next world empire, the Persian Empire, 538 B.C., 67 years later, Daniel continues. Talk about persistence. Daniel didn't hang up his coat and say, okay, I've won this test. I can take it easy the rest of my life. He's going to be thrown in a lion's den in his 80s. He starts out as a teenage boy thrust in Babylon. And the whole time, with all the trials and tribulation he faces, living in a pagan land, all this false religion all around him, he continues to faithfully serve his God. He prays three times a day, kneeling with the window open, headed toward Jerusalem, praying for Jerusalem, the holy city. They use that against him. He's going to be thrown in the lion's den. But even then, as here, God is going to come to his rescue and protect him, deliver him. Don't give out. Be persistent. Don't throw up your hands and say, I've had enough. I just can't do it anymore. Be persistent. Daniel continued until the time of Cyrus because he was in it for the long haul. It took time. All things take time. But Daniel won in the end. And his influence made an incredible difference. And that's why here we are preaching on him centuries later. If Daniel had done like most of us do, Well, when we're faced with confrontations, we're faced with problems, we're faced with difficulties in our society, and we decide, oh, I don't want to cause any trouble. I'll just try to get along with everybody. I'll I'll keep my beliefs to myself. I don't want anybody to know what I think, what I believe. Then Daniel would have been unknown. You notice that? Throughout the Bible, I'm constantly coming across people. If they did like most of us, we just take the easy way out. Let's just keep the peace. We don't want to ruffle any feathers. We just live our lives and die. Not really standing for anything. But the people in the Bible, you read over and over again, they were different. In fact, I've got a book at home that's called They Dared to Be Different. And that's why we remember them. They were godly people who took a stand for the Lord no matter the cost. No matter the cost. 1 Samuel 2.30, chapter 2, verse 30 says... God honors them who honor him. Daniel really fits that description. He honored God in spite of enormous opposition, 
Incredible how a teenage slave boy from Jerusalem could take on the greatest empire of the world, the Babylonian Empire, and win the day. You know the rest of the story with Daniel. He arises to be, it's like Joseph. Remember I said Joseph was the other one that just can't hardly find anything bad about him. Joseph rose to number two in the Egyptian empire following God. Daniel's going to rise to number three in the Babylonian empire. Always being faithful to God. Folks, what does that tell us? You don't have to compromise. You don't have to give in. You don't have to be like the world to get somewhere. You never know what God might do with you. We don't know. But we do know that we have to be faithful. We have to honor God and leave the rest up to him. So wrapping this up, Daniel knows what we face today because he was there. He has walked where we are walking, and he's left us a pattern to follow. Will we be faithful? Will we dare to be like Daniel? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the power of your word to touch our hearts and to change lives. Thank you for changing my life when I was a teenage boy going in a very different direction and how you opened up my eyes one night with the gospel of Jesus Christ and what an incredible journey you have put me on. Thank you, God, for being so faithful. Thank you for allowing me to preach your holy word and to persevere all these years through the ups and downs of living for you. We know, God, that you never promised us a bed of roses. You never promised us easy street. You just promised that you would be faithful as we are faithful to you. Thank you for that. Great is thy faithfulness. Be with each one here today, God, and bless them. Help them to respond as your spirit leads them. And I pray for this church, God, as they look to the future, that you will see fit to rise up their future leaders, that you have to come and lead these people in the direction you would have them go. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have an invitation, and if God so moves you to make a public decision of some kind, and if you're here today and you don't have assurance of salvation, we invite you to speak. please come and speak. Let us know that. Speak to us, and I'll be glad to show you how you can truly know salvation without any doubt. The scriptures teach us that. If you're a Christian, but you know that you need something to t change in your life to help you walk as you know you should walk with the Lord, we invite you just to pray. You don't have to come forward. Just pray in, in, in your, your pew. Just pray as God leads you. I'm here to help in any way I can. I'll be glad to help anyone, but you do what you know God is leading you to do. Let's all stand as we, we have the invitation. Brother.
surface. Um, thank you, Pastor Blair, for that wonderful message. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, this morning. Just a few quick things. Uh, again, we're still looking for uh, a children's church coordinator and, and some willing workers for that. So if uh, uh, you uh, feel led, um, please see Richard about that. Uh, next Sunday, there will be a special called business meeting where we will be um, voting on uh, our uh, interim pastor. So uh, please be here. Uh, and, um, and that will be after church next Sunday. Uh, and there will also be a leadership uh, team meeting after, after that. Um, I believe, let's see. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing out on? All right. All hearts free this morning. Amen. All right, well, if that is it, I hope you all have a blessed Sunday and a blessed week. And if you all would, let's stand and we'll be dismissed with Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Y'all have a blessed week.